Stanford University. I enjoyed this week myself, um, and I tried to build on the former lecturer's work, and, and I will present it in a slightly different way, and, and that's perhaps the main aim of this presentation. So I will connect to many of the topics covered, but I will try to do it from a quantum chemist point of view. <clears throat> um, and I'll try to tell you what that is. And in those, this context, I present a lot of applications in different fields, some of them ran, somehow random. And that has been the sort of drive for myself in this. I have a very nice collaborations, and I have had the patience to sort of explain the experiments to me in a way that I can understand. And that has been the virtue of the quantum chemistry in this sense, I think, is that we can really get two different methods which are completely technically different to actually talk to each other and use the same time of terminology. So I'll start with a question, which is more almost rhetorical, but if you have any ideas, why would we like to do theoretical simulations? I mean, if you look at what they present from the experimental work, they usually have this mental picture that they perform a beautiful experiment and they get out the film of actually what's happening. So what do you think, what, where do I come in? Any ideas? Okay, I'll give you my point of view, what, what's the point of, of doing this, and that is in order to actually see all the chemistry going on, we need somehow to develop, we have to interpret the experimental spectra. So that's perhaps the main point in this. And that can be done on very different well levels. I mean, you can have this quantitative analysis where you really do it number by number and try to do it as accurate as possible. In many experiments, that's simply not possible and we have to resort to some sort of qualitative assignment. And it all comes down to defining the information contents. So why do you use a certain spectroscopic technique? And there I think theory can help a lot to try to define all the features and all the possible effects and what is actually possible to get out from the experiment. Of course, from my point of view, it also goes into evaluating different models and approximations and see what techniques I can use for particular types of problems, experiments and, and spectra. And I try to present this to you through a series of examples. <clears throat> but of course, in order to make sense of that, I will also describe on a rather shallow level the type of techniques. So practically, what do we calculate and how do we make this link to the experiments? And of course, for each difficult, different case, what kind of information can we extract? <clears throat> and what are the limitations? So apart from the time-resolved experiments that I've been working with, I also have a long-time collaboration in the field of energy-related uh, applications, and in particular in solar cells. I, I use this as an example base. And these are very complex systems. A lot of processes are going on and a lot of different chemical components building up the chemical process. These are so solar cells where you have to create the current by shining light on them. And you want to optimize the output and the efficiency and the currents and, and potential that you get out from. So the initial process is studying the dye molecules used to sensitize them so that they are efficient in an ordinary solar light. We can look at changes in electronic structure and what's happening in the solution because there's a lot of regeneration processes, charge transport going on. There's also processes going on which destroys the solar cells. And also this is of course important to, to understand the efficiency and the duration of these uh, uh, materials. And I tried to give in, in the applications in connection to this conference different kinds of aspects of ultra-fast dynamics. So you can have, have effects of ultra-fast dynamics going on in the ground state in solution for example. You can induce processes looking at what's happening after this photoabsorption in the system. But we can also have spectroscopic effects, as we heard in the previous talks, which is, might be very important to understand the information content in the different spectroscopies. <clears throat> 
In the presentation, I will divide it into four parts. We can see how much time I get for this fourth uh, part, but I will begin by presenting the method. So the theoretical spectacles that I'm using, what is that? And why I have I chosen this kind of framework in order to make the connection to X-ray spectroscopy? I talk about the, how we make the links to the different techniques. And the type of information that I will focus on is how we present core excited states, where we can look at the effects of core hole decay, decay and different types of dynamics in the system, and how we simulate core ionization and valence ionization, connecting very much to Philippe's talk recently. Uh, and you have different types of, of aspects from the modeling. So there are many different techniques to model core excitations. And I will present one. And I will try to, in particular, stress the limitations of this method. And it is introduced by particular purposes. But it's also very important to understand where it's not useful. Defining the, the information content in X-ray emission, then we go to the dynamics. In particular, the nuclear dynamics happening through, through this very short lifetime in the core excited states. And from the photo emission, as you saw, we have an ability to look at the chem chemical dynamics. So actually bond breaking and what's happening there. So I won't have many equations. So Philippe's indicated that I might have more equations than he does, but not very much. I would try to make some few points where I go a little bit into detail. And this is one point. So I repeat the Born-Oppenheimer approximation. So what we want to do in the Born-Oppenheimer approximation, we want to simplify the full quantum system. So we have a quantum wave function for the nuclear and electronic degrees of freedom. And in order to get a practical tool, we need to simplify the problem. So we somehow want to separate it. <clears throat> and the basis of this is, of course, when we look at the Hamiltonian of the system, we can recognize that the two kinetic operators have very different magnitude due to the masses of the electrons and the nuclei. Even for the hydrogen, there is a large ratio between the masses. And that, of course, means that the frequencies and the time scales of the processes are very different. <clears throat> so what we do first is to separate the Hamiltonian into two parts. One where we have the nuclear kinetic energy, and we, we, we sort of sum up all the electronic terms and one part where we actually try to solve the electronic Hamiltonian. And as Philip mentioned, we do that for a fixed geometry. So we sort of assume that we can look at the stationary geometry of the molecule, and we can solve the time-independent Schrodinger equation for this particular case. And that generates a set of eigenstates to the Hamiltonians. And these are then the total energies and the total energy electronic states that are available for this particular Hamiltonian. And the nice thing is that this set of states creates a complete set with which we can expand any wave. Any function can be expanded in this set of wave functions. And that means, of course, that if we would, if we would look at the total wave function, now restricted to that particular geometry, we can make an exact expansion of the wave function in terms of the electronic solutions, the different electronic states. And of course, the next step is, is to do that at all geometries. So when you do that at all geometries, you can express the full wave function exactly in terms of these coefficients in front of the electronic wave functions. And these coefficients we call the nuclear wave function. So for each electronic state, we have a different nuclear wave function, if you like, formed by the coefficients in front of this complete set expansion. And then the Born-Oppenheimer approximation naturally comes in, where we simply separate it and, and consider individual terms in this sum, decouple the individual terms in this sum. And that is the Born-Oppenheimer approximation. And then you separate it so you have an electronic wave function that you want to solve for, and you have a nuclear wave function that you can solve for. 
the difficulty comes in that this approximation breaks down at places where these curves come close to each other and couple strongly to each other. And that sort of puts all of this that we are trying to do in the ultra-fast uh, X-ray community into to a, a difficult position because here, when we do the chemical reactions, these surfaces will come close to each other and we will go away from the born oppenheimer approximation. That's something we always have to consider. And if it's a small system like a diatomics, which Philip showed, then it's quite easy to do this. But if we have a real case system of a solution, a solute in a solution, or something happening in a solid or a surface, then it's quite difficult to make this separation and, and figure out how you can treat some degrees of freedoms on the quantum level and some degrees of freedom on the classical level, perhaps. So that's something we are aiming for. And there are many different types of techniques. One very strong technique being developed here in Stanford by Todd Martinez, for example. But there are many others, and, and these come in to these experiments very essentially. So this is, this is a slide, which is a whole quantum chemistry course, and you have to take it for what that is. I try to point to the, the specific things that I want to use, and the type of limitations that different methods can have. So quantum chemistry developed in the 30s is based on this very simple idea that you can separate the total electronic wave function now, many body electronic wave function, into an independent particle approximation, where you can talk about independent molecular orbitals. <clears throat> and that is, of course, a limitation. And the main limitation is that momentary electron-electron correlation in the system is missing. So each electron only sees an average field of the other electrons, as Robin pointed out in the first lecture. The advantage is that it forms a very natural basis for chemistry, thinking about chemical bonding and how the electronic structure of a molecule is built up, which this picture that we get here, as we've seen in the previous lectures, very naturally corresponds to the type of spectroscopies you can use in the X-rays. And that is really the, the, the aim for me. I see a, a spectroscopic technique which is very easy to translate what I talk about into experimental observables. So that's an attraction from my point of view. Of course, this missing electron correlation is something that we would try to include because this method as such is very nice. It gives nice pictures, but if you want to do chemistry, the accuracy is simply not good enough. And therefore, this electron correlation is, is trying to, we have to include that in the, some way. One way is the DFT approach, which has been developed sort of in parallel in the solid state community, but was introduced into chemistry in the 90s because then the approximation had lead, led to a level of accuracy which was possible to apply to molecules meaningfully. So by the different functionals, the different expressions for evaluating this correlation energy, you can actually get the average accuracy which has chemical significance. We can talk about the chemical reactions. At the same time, there has been other methods developed which were much more time consuming and computationally demanding, but which are much more flexible. And the reason that I want to stress to you the use of these in this talk is that when we go to excited states, core excited states, especially when we go to the, the inner levels like 2P excitations and so forth, it's essential to have a more flexible wave function. So this wave function, which is similar in DFT and Hartree-Fock, a, a single determinant describing the system, is not applicable to certain excited states. In some cases it is, but it's very limited and you always have to evaluate the methods when you go to excited states. So here instead, the electron correlation is built in by having a linear expansion of different determinants. You can view them as different excitations of the ground state, giving different permutations of electrons. And this gives the, in the limit of considering all types of excitations, 
you can include all this electron correlation exactly. So that's the, the sort of nice thing with this level of quantum chemistry, is that it's totally variational, and the better method you are using, the more accurate result you do, you, you get. And that is the flaw of the DFT. It is amazingly successful, but you don't know how to evaluate different methods within DFT against each other. There's no hierarchy of methods. Okay, so this is the type of methods I will use. I will mostly use DFT and show where it's useful and where it's not useful. And I show when we want to do this more high level quantum chemistry. On the dynamic sides, you can put yourselves on different levels of approximation depending on the problem. A very simple approximation is to use classical dynamics, simply a Newtonian evolution of the system. To do that, you need the forces, which defines the evolution, and the forces you get from the potential. So these are the potential energy surfaces that we talked about. And you can express them in very many different ways, and I'll come, go into detail in some particular ways. But that's all you need. Wow. If you, if you have the forces, you can follow any type of system, regardless of complexity. Not even, not only diatomics, but you can follow a, a really large system efficiently on this level of approximation. And of course, in some cases, it's not, not enough. When you have these crossings or when you have very light nuclei like hydrogen, you need to include other methods. And in some cases, you, you use classical methods anyhow because you, you are forced or limited to that, but you have, always have to consider the limitation. This is summarizing everything I will talk about when it comes to simulating spectra. So if the last slide was the quantum chemistry, this is the quantum chemistry applied to the spectroscopies. And there is two levels, and that has been iterated many times during this uh, summer school. You can talk about the electronic states, which is the total energy picture, or you can talk about the orbitals. And both of these are very useful for making the connection. But of course, the most accurate method is the total energies, where we would consider a ground state, electronic states. You can consider the core excitations to different core, level, core excited states. And you have the valence excited states. And the energy transition energies in the spectroscopies is simply the total energy difference between these electronic states. Whereas the intensities would be calculated by operators for the transition, putting in the total energy multi-electron wave function. On the other hand, we have the molecular orbitals, which gives us these nice energy levels, and we can talk about transitions of L individual electrons between the energy levels. And in this language, we instead express the energy, the transition energies in the spectroscopies in terms of orbital energy differences. So if you redistribute your electrons, so first approximation, the energy will change by the difference in, in eigenstate energies of these one electron orbitals. And you can have valence excitations. This is the highest occupied molecular orbital going to the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. Or you can have core excitations where you go into different core levels. But it's the same expression used. And because in this framework, we will calculate the transition moment, which really should involve a total many body wave function in terms of the one electron orbitals. And that is because we are using the same orbital set for all the different electronic states that we want to represent. And that means that whatever we are not affecting in this system, will just give a unity contribution to this integral. So only the orbitals involved in the transition will have to be taken into account in the transition moment. And that's, of course, very, very, uh, a very large simplification when you do this. And it also means that if you would compare the effort to calculate 
a transition or the spectrum in this framework, you would have to calculate a lot of different uh, electronic states, each possibly a different quantum chemical calculation. Whereas here you just do one single quantum chemical calculation, you get full, this full spectrum at one shot. And that is, of course, an enormous advantage. The kind of information that we get out is the energies and the transition moments. So that means that we get this kind of stick spectrum. And whenever we want to do in a comparison to the experiment, we have to take in to account the limitation to the experiment, the lifetime broadening, and all kind of dynamic effects that could go into this broadening. And that is made on different levels of, of accuracy, depending on what we compare to. And it, of course, is related to what is the accuracy that you can generate from the experimental side. But the interesting thing is regardless if you use these approximate methods where you use the corn sham molecular orbitals or you use the state-to-state -state transitions, we get the sp peak spectrum in both cases and we can treat it very similarly in both cases. So now I just go through and show you explicitly how we calculate different kinds of spectroscopies. So if you look at the photoionization, photoemission spectroscopy, or the X-ray emission spectroscopy, we very simply base this on this orbital scheme on the low level, so on the, in the orbital representation. And it's electronic ground state calculation which can be done in any quantum chemical program. So it can be done on small molecules in f large periodic systems. And you calculate the molecular orbitals and the, their energies, and that is then forming the basis for generating spectra. And that means that we can easily compare the, the performance of different methods, different density functionals, or different programs and approximations. <clears throat> but it's on the orbital representation level. And for me, the striking thing, I take now an application from the solar cell field. It's a whole conductor used to regenerate the dyes in the solar cells so that they can absorb another photon. And the striking thing is that if you compare to the experimental spectrum, now over an energy range of 20 EVs, the calculations are ridiculously in good agreement. It's amazing how well this very naive and simplified approximation works. And in, in particular, perhaps in the field of quantum chemistry, I mean, the Kornsham orbitals are only introduced as a trick to get a good description of the density function approximations. It doesn't have any physical meaning. And still, we can use them very efficiently. And it sort of relates a little bit to the Koopman's theorem in Hartree-Fock, but still, it, it just works. What doesn't work is the absolute energy scale. So if you have a look at the, in this comparison I made, I allowed myself to shift the, the, the calculated spectrum. And otherwise, it's just a calculation of the total density of states, which means that I take each electronic state, assign it with an intensity one, and then I, I, I convolute that and make it a comparison to experiment. And in this particular uh, system, we were interested in understanding the valence band edge, but of course, these are the states involved in the whole conduction, the charge transport. And we could sort of decompose it into different, different contribution, looking at the molecular orbitals and seeing the character of the molecular orbitals, which forms the basis for this total photo emission spectrum. And we can qualify what is happening. And in particular, we made a comparison then to this larger unit and a smaller unit and could see how the aromaticity of the molecule, the conjugation of this molecule splits the valent band edge into several peaks and how that sort of creates the state involved in the whole conduction. So this is just to show you it's dead easy to do these calculations. And many of you perhaps even do them. When it comes to the extra absorption process, we want to simulate this kind of process, taking an electron from a low level and creating a core hole. 
and we want to create calculate it for many transitions not only this particular transition but we want to calculate the whole spectrum and then again we use this kind of simplified approximation we make a single quantum chemical calculation you can do them slightly different where you have a core hole or half a core hole just uh, pragmatically to see which kind of method is the method giving the best agreement with the experiment. Of course, there is a theory behind motivating different type of approximations, but these kind of techniques are, are very pragmatically used. So you try to see what method is most appropriate for the kind of model compounds you have, and then you can use it to investigate new problems. And here is an, again an example from the solar cell applications. We have these dye molecules. In these particular dye molecules, we have units which contain nitrogen at different sites. And the nice thing with the extra absorption here is, of course, that you can start to analyze the electronic structure of these complex dyes to see what states are involved in the foot excitation and the charge transfer. So if you look at the total experimental extra absorption spectrum, we can simulate that by performing these calculations with core holes on different nitrogen atoms in the molecule and add up the spectrum. And we can see that the sum spectrum is in reasonable agreement, not perfect agreement, but still it sort of allows us to qualitatively represent the spectrum and start to analyze it. And we can look at the individual contributions where we see that the pi star states of these units creates the low-lying states which are involved in the, the photo excitation and in particular in the charge injection happening. So you have a photo excitation which creates a charge separation because the charge ends up on the aromatic unity which is attached to the semiconductor and conducts away the electron. And you can start to sort of think about what kind of, of um, dye molecules or organic units should you use to get as efficient charge separation as possible. Because the main problem in these materials is that you get the back reaction, which sort of quenches the, the charge separation. So that it's essential to create units where you have a large charge separation and a fast diffusion of the, the different charges. <clears throat> and in the quantum chemical language, we, we can relate it to this kind of molecular orbital theory where we talk about the pi bonding and the sigma bonding and how this builds up the electronic structure. One important thing is that in the modeling of these effects, in order to get them accurate, we need to do a calculation for the extra absorption, which includes the core hole. Because the localized states are strongly pulled down by the presence of the core hole. So if you compare to what we did with the X-ray emission where we used the electronic ground state, those kind of calculations are not a, a good basis when we think about the molecular orbital approximation. So instead you try to represent it on a different level. I'll show you one more example where we show how we can make this strong link to quantum chemistry going all the way from simulating spectra to detailed understanding of how this chemical bonding is formed in the molecules. And there we use the series of compounds varying the d orbitals, sort of the size of the, the molecular cloud around the transition metal, to see how that interacts with the ligands. And we compare photo emission spectrum and extra absorption spectrum. The extra absorption spectrum is performed on the nitrogen edge, so we get sort of a projection of the local density of states in this compound onto the, the nitrogen. And that allows us to analyze the overlap with the transition metal. For the photo em emission, we looked at it at high energies. And the reason for that is that then, then you get the very high cross-section for the metal, the heavy elements. And we are able to highlight the d orbitals in the system. If you look at the modeling of the nitrogen spectra, we see that we can separate it into blue lines, which are due to pi orbitals, 
and we into sigma's star orbiters. And then I talk about the bond between the transition metal and the ligands. And in particular, the change in the sigma bonding to the metal is changing with the, with the size of the transition metal. And you can see that this kind of state, this particular molecular orbital gives rise to the signature of the changing peak that is observed both in the experiment and the calculation. And that is simply due to the states, if you have an octahedral symmetry, which is the filled states of T2G symmetry, which overlap in the pi interaction with the ligands, and the EG molecular orbitals, which overlap with the sigma bonding. So what we are seeing here is a shift of the EG levels. When we go into the foot emission spectrum, we can sort of simulate the peak, and we can see that we get one strong peak and some weak peaks in, in all of the simulated spectra. And this strong peak is due to the filled T2D levels. But these extra peak, these are then arising from the interaction between the transition metal and the ligands. So here we are looking at, at orbital mixing or hybridization of the states, if you like. And this kind of, of modeling then, looking at the details of the quantum chemistry and the molecular orbitals building up the spectrum, allowed us to make an assignment of the peaks and a description of the electronic bonding. And we can see how if you go from the pyridine molecule, you form the bipyridine and you get a slightly different width or, or dispersion of the states. If you form a manganese complex, you retain almost the same structure. Some of the states are pulled down by the charge of the center uh, cation. And only when you go into the transition metals where you have the d orbitals, you create this mixing between the ligand and the transition metal orbitals. Which is, of course, essential in, in, in how this material works and how these dye molecules work. And this will very nicely then, let's Keep this. This we very nicely can correlate to the experiment. So we can, by aligning the photo emission, the X-ray absorption spectrum, get this complete description of the electronic st structure and the interaction between the ligands and the transition. How do I'm doing with time? About half. Half. Okay. Good. Let me spend just one brief. Um, question on this. So if we look in detail on the T2G levels, which are due to these states, we see that going from the light elements to the heavy, heavy element, we create a splitting. So do you have any idea what this is due to? Anybody? The hint is that the heavy element the more important the relativi relativistic effects are. And what you create is a coupling between the electron spin and the orbital angular momentum, such that the final state in this spectroscopy creates a splitting due to spin-orbit coupling. So if you think about it, you go from an initial state of Sing singlet uh, character, a final state of doublet character, where you have a possibility to couple the electron spin with an orbital angular momentum. And that then creates, if you would have spherical symmetry, it would create a splitting of the, on the level of these two uh, therm symbols, each of which containing sort of individual electronic microstates. And this we calculate on the level of, of this multi-configurational technique, the post hartree fort method. The, the technique is called CAS-SEF, and you add dynamic, uh, additional dynamic correlation. But importantly, you add a spin-orbit coupling. In order to generate anything like this, you have to take this into account. And that gives you the sort of change in width 
of the spectrum because the, the spin orbit coupling is negligible and within the, the peak width for the lighter elements, but for osmium, you have a large effect of this. And that sort of puts the limit. So, I mean, we have this nice tool of the DFT. We can describe the electronic structure in, in great detail, but when it comes to the small details in the spectroscopy, which might be very important for analyzing the spectroscopy, you really have to think about the limitations. So you might have to go to higher level theory to, to investigate it. Okay. Um, these potential energy curves. So in most talks, we have this two-dimensional graph where we consider a single degree of freedom. So we sort of try to capture the dynamics of what's happening in a single, single reaction coordinate. And that is, of course, an oversimplification. So not only should we consider a series of different electronic states to generate the spectra, but in principle, we should consider an n, 3n minus 6 dimensional potential energy surface for each of these electronic states. And that, of course, depends on the accuracy with which we want to simulate the spectra and the type of effects happening in the spectroscopy, whether it's important to consider this or not. So I will go through a, a few different examples where it is important to consider this. And it's divided into parts where you consider dynamics happening in the ground state, dynamics happening because of photo-induced processes like dissociation happening up here. And this is a particular case because when you have dissociated uh, dynamics and the dissoci dissociative potential energy curve, you no longer have these discrete energy levels. You get a continuum of uh, nuclear quantized states that you would have to consider. And you have overlapping potentials and bonded and, and partially dissociative uh, curves. Okay. And one powerful tool in this is, as I said, molecular dynamic simulation. And very briefly, it's usually mostly applicable to, to larger systems because there you can't afford to do more accurate simulations. In a simple one-dimensional system, diatomics, you can do it at any level of accuracy in quantum dynamics. But here we are restricted somehow. You have larger systems, could be solid or a solution. <clears throat> you try to initiate the process by finding a configuration which you think is likely to be present. And then you use the forces. So you calculate the forces from the potential energy surface, which could be derived from quantum chemistry or some simplified semi-empirical force field. And then you derive, taking the mass into account, how the particle is accelerated. And of course, then having the initial conditions, positions, possibly velocities, you can update the positions. You can update the velocities to slightly later time uh, interval. And you do this at very short time steps because we want to follow the motion as accurately as possible. And then we sort of see how the particle moves. And the typical time scale for doing this is 0.1 femtoseconds or 1 femtosecond, depending on the system and the weights of the, the masses of the, of the particles. And you generate a simulation, which is because this is a PowerPoint, isn't running, but you can imagine that everything is moving at the same time. All the different degrees of freedoms are involved. And you, because of this complexity in these systems, whatever you do, you need to do sampling. And that's not, in principle, not only simulating the quantum ground state, but it's simulating a lot of degrees of freedoms which might not be important for the process you are looking at, but sort of orthogonal directions which are influencing the widths of the peaks in the spectrum. <coughs> and you typically do this with short time scale. <coughs> the time scale of the simulation, the total trajectory time, varies with the type of method you can do. And I will focus in particular on a quantum chemical method called ab initio molecular dynamic simulation, which has the advantage that we take the forces 
on the particles, treating them, them classically from a quantum calculation of the electronic Hamiltonian. So that means that once we have optimized the electronic Hamiltonian for the particular configuration of the nuclei, we can calculate the forces by evaluating the gradient with respect to each degree of freedom. So for each particle and each direction of this particle, we calculate the, the uh, force. And we're using the hellman feynman theory so that for the same wave function, we can evaluate the force by evaluating the gradient of the Hamiltonian. And doing this in the DFT, on the TFT level, you can simulate really large systems, like small pieces of DNA, if you like, for very short times. And that means that you can, because of the basis in quantum chemistry, you can simulate rather complex systems where it might be difficult to find an accurate force field. You can simulate bond breakage, dissociation of molecules, and what is interesting for me is that you can simulate excited states also. So you, by determining the, the, the excited state that you look at the, at the quantum chemical calculation, you of course get the forces corresponding to that electronic state. And you are not restricted to the ground state depending on the, the method you are using in the quantum chemistry. The sampling, because this is classical, that's done by simulating several trajectories, either in the ground state or in the excited states, to sample over different events and how the process might react to light depending on the condition of this particular configuration you are starting from. Yeah. So, if you do fully classically, you don't take into account phase, and so nothing can interfere. The G in here kind of a semi classical phase. Lagrangian and, and get interference? I haven't it's heard of such techniques. I don't think you would, you, you would use this kind of technique if you are interested in coherences. So, but what you can do is, of course, you can simulate the synchronization on a classical level. That's what you can do. So that sort of defines the, the toolbox. We have methods for simulating the, the initial state or the excited state so dynamics. And we have methods for simulating the electronic structure and the spectra. So now I'll go through, and we see how far I get, uh, a series of applications. So I start with the water molecule, because it's, it's so well studied and so simple to describe. I start with the Ricks technique, because there I can make this very strong link to the electronic states. So if you think about the X-ray absorption and X-ray emission process is happening through a, a scattering, X-ray scattering process. This has been presented in many of the talks. This is now in the total energy scheme where you have the electronic ground state lowest and you go up to core excited states and valence excited, down to valence excited states. Then you generate this kind of spectrum. And you put it next to the X-ray absorption spectrum, spectrum where we can see that excitations into the first peak generates a series of different decay pathways. So that for going to this lowest core excited state, there are many different final states you end up in. And that, here's the important, that you have to consider all of these different combinations. And for each final state, you would have to consider all different pathways to reach that state. And that means that within this peak, of course, there are many different nuclear quantum levels, vibrations of the nuclear, and they have to be considered when we, when we do this accurately. Now I only describe the quantum chemistry, so the electronic states. So when we, when we simulate this, we have a set of things that we need. So we need the ground states, core excited state, the valence excited states, and in principle we need the potentials in order to generate the nuclear wave functions in this multi-dimensional landscape of the molecule or the system. And then we need the transition moments for both these parts of the process. And all of this we pull into the kramer heisenberg equation to, to simulate the spectra. And then you have to think about what kind of method could I use. Uh, you could use the orbital representation, but it has too much limitations. I don't want to start there. 
let's instead consider what kind of techniques there are in quantum chemistry where we, where we could, uh, which we can apply to the spectrum simulations. There is a list of acronyms, and for those of you who are not active, I don't, won't explain it, but I focus on this method, which I will explain a little bit. And this has the advantage that you can define spaces of orbitals. So we have talked about how we consider these orbital transitions, but now we will do accurate calculations, but based on the orbital intuition. So we do a calculation, a ground state calculation, we get a series of orbitals, and we will use subspaces of these where we generate the excited states. So within the green box, we will consider all permutations of electrons, which we consider to be excitations then. And that will form a basis of determinants used to describe all the excited states of interest. And we will use a particular form called restricted, where we define additional subspaces to make the calculations more efficient. And in particular, the lowest orbital space is used to create the, the core holes then, the core excitations. So the advantage of this is that it is electron correlation. The static and co dynamic electron correlation can be included very accurately. And that means that the energy levels and the transition moments can be evaluated very accurately. It also has the advantage that valence excited states, which are difficult to describe, are generally very well described in this technique. This is a well-established technique in the valence excitation scheme. It allows for dissociation and chemical changes in, in the molecule. And what we will show is that it also allows for an accurate representation of the core excitations. And there, in particular, using a relativistic quantum chemical uh, calculation within this scheme allows us to include spin-orbit coupling very efficiently. So now is a brief question. So practically what we do is that we consider how many excitations do you generate? And we have this combinatorical problem that we have after the core excitations, we will have seven electrons in this space. So one electron will be pulled up here. So instead of a fast in mass, you have seven electrons in 10 orbitals. You have to consider that you create holes here also. So how many states do you create? Anybody daring? Yes? As you all know, what we use is this combinatorial function to evaluate the number of, of, of possible combination permutations of the electrons. So if you start by considering the ground state and all the valence excitations that we cre create, it would be putting six, six balls into two, to 10 boxes, and it's around 200 microstates, 200 electronic states that you reach. For the core excitations, we would have one hole out of two down here, and we will have seven, uh, seven holes, or three holes out of, of 10 up here, and around 200 states again. And that means that for the electronic states, we have a, a reasonable number of determinants used to describe each electronic transition. So each electronic transition is described in the same basis of determinant, but with different weights, depending on the electronic state. And you generate something like this. So you generate a set of valence excitations. This is the ground state, and you have seven, nine EV excitations. I only put out a, a, a limited list now of these valence excitations. You also have a set of core excitations. And because you can calculate the transition moments, you can calculate the transition from the ground state to the core excitation and back again. And that generates a RICS map. It's a very simplified RICS map because we haven't included all the electronic states we need and we haven't included all the effects we would need to include, but it sort of gives us the basis. And this shows this essential effect of how to interpret the, the Rick spectrum. So that for, for a given core excitation, it will correlate only with certain valence excitations. So that these, of these three first excitations, only this, the 
first and the third gives a high intensity to a particular valence excitation. And that is because if you look at the determinants then, the first core excitation, which involves then the, the lowest unoccupied state, is correlated only with the states of valence excitations which have an electron in the similar orbital. So going up here, the probability of falling down into the core hole is only significant if there is a strong overlap with the core excited wave. So the red state will be the decay pathways for the first core excitation. For the second core excitation, there will be a different set of final states which have a high uh, decay probability. And thereby you sort of get a nice interpretation of the Rick spectrum linking it to the UV spectrum. Now making the transition of, of interpretation from electronic states to molecular orbitals, orbitals becomes much more natural if we transform this into an emission energy scale instead. So instead of looking at as energy loss and electronic excitations of the final state, we will try to look at the emission energy coming out. And then what you see is that you create these lines. And these lines are then validating the molecular orbital interpretation. So that for this given line here, they all involve the case involving the highest molecular orbital. So that you do core excitations to different unoccupied levels, but you, you all only look at the K from this. And this is more or less constant in energy. So it sort of tells us that the molecular orbital framework is a natural basis for interpretation. We also see more detailed effects, and to understand these, we need to go to the electronic states and do these accurate calculations. But on the lowest level, a molecular orbital interpretation is enough to assign the spectrum. There's additional features here that it becomes really constant at higher energies simply because the electron is, is no longer present. It's going away from the system. So this forms a language then. We can put all these different spectroscopies in connection to the same type of quantum chemistry calculations and, and establish this strong link between the spectroscopies via the quantum chemistry. But there are complications. <clears throat> uh, one complication I show here, if I compare the gas phase X-ray emission spectrum of water molecules, where you have different weights of the hydrogen. So going from hydrogen to deuterium. So do you have any ideas about these differences are due to? Anybody? You, Sam. Yeah, um, basically, uh, one expects that uh, if you use uh, heavy water, the, uh, the nuclear dynamics is slower. So it has something to do with the weights of, and the, perhaps the inertia of these atoms, precisely. And you can see that there are very delicate things. You really change the peak shape. You even create substructure in the peaks so that although these are individual electronic states, there are additional information then to be pulled out. And here we come to the potential energy surfaces. To get out this information, it's not enough to consider only a fixed geometry. We really have to, to represent the whole potential energy surface and try to understand what is happening. <clears throat> and the surprising thing in these cases is that because of the lightness of the hydrogen, although you have a very, very short lifetime, so the dynamics that can happen in this intermediate core excited state is still sufficient to perturb the spectra. And there, that's sort of coming to the details which makes it more interesting to study these techniques from a theoretical point of view. You have to consider many different effects to really reproduce the experimental spectra. And I, there are dynamical effects, there are also effects of the polarization and really considering how these different transition moments that we calculate affects the spectrum. I will talk mostly about this effect. And we can represent it on a, on a low level very 
inaccurately but still essentially giving the information that we are after. Considering what's happening in different core excited states, so depending on which core excited state we go, the potential energy surface will be looking differently. And that means that the molecule will react. The response in the molecular geometry will be different in different core excited states. So here I very naively started from the ground state geometry, going up it to a core excited state and followed the dynamics for uh, 20 femtoseconds. For all of these geometries, I can use the simplified molecular orbital theory to generate spectra, X-ray emission spectrum. And we can see how this, the geometry affects the spectrum. The spectral response to this geometry change. It depends on the core excitation and the amount of distortion going on here. <clears throat> and including this, we can represent the experimental differences at different excitation energies at the lowest core excited states or the core ionized states. There's also, yes? Can you understand from the orbital character why you coupled to this particular motion? So yes, you can. So if one is a lone pair, why does it couple to this particular motion? So for the resonant excitations, you go up into particular valence anti-bonding states and these, by populating the antibonding states, just as in Philip's talk, you will induce a weakening of, of a bond or a dissociation of the molecule. I don't understand. Uh, so, particular example, V1 is this lone pair, right? The so homo lone pair. Ah, this is a wrong. Uh, th this is. Yes, this is a lone pair, and this is the in plane antibonding. So, why does the population of. I still have all the other valence electrons in place, first of all, right? So but there's still the same bonding character. Let me see if I find a, a molecular orbital picture to simplify for, for the audience. Ah, no, it's Here, precisely. So these are the, the in-plane orbitals. Oh, no, I see. This is the, the lone pair, which is not bonding, but it's also not forming a bonding anti bonding formation. So it's still not intuitive. Think about it the following way. And now, Go into an unoccupied level. The unoccupied level is your, what is it? This one. The 4A1. Yeah. So it lives up there, way up there. This one. Mm -hmm. The other electrons are still there. They're still stabilizing the bond. Now you just add more valence electrons. That doesn't mean they destabilize the bond. Why should they? Actually, more electron density around. I never got this argument. We, if you go to the simple case of the hydrogen molecule, what you do when you form the bond is that you create one bonding combination of the molecular orbitals and one okay. anti-bonding. Hydrogen is a little bit cheating in this context because there are only two electrons around. Let me make my argument with a different one. You now have, you still have your hydrogen configuration and you still got this bonding orbital. So now you add more electrons to hydrogen. Yes, you would have a core somewhere, which of course with hydrogen doesn't exist. And you would put electrons in this, in this anti-binding orbital. You still, however, have the binding orbital. So now just naively thinking about the screening of the positive charges on the hydrogen, you just added more valence density. I don't understand why it should destabilize mm, OK. Bond. I think it's, it's actually two effects. One is the fact that you're actually putting an electron into an anti-bonding state. The other effect that you're, is uh, that you're, instead of having a water molecule, you create something like a fluorine molecule. And for those of you in the audience who are chemists, we know that the, the stable form of the fluoride is this. So that, that's sort of two effects. And it means that both of these are, are contributing very strongly to, to the molecular motion in so the, the lowest excited state. The fluorine, if you actually now rearrange the whole electron structure. Precisely. So this electron is uh, relaxed to this. That's a very good point. Thank you. So but this simplified scheme of simple classical dynamics allows us to understand the basic dynamical effects in these cases. We can also notice that there are certain differences between the photoelectron and the X-ray 
uh, a photo emission and the X-ray emission spectroscopy is in that because of the similarities of the coral and the valence hole excited states, these peaks can have another shape, another uh, width than the photo emission spectrum. That is because here you are creating a charged state, whereas here you are, have similar types of states, only uh, differing in where the electrons are placed. <clears throat> and that makes it interesting to compare the photoelectron and the X-ray emission spectrum used to study these uh, dynamic effects. So if you think about performing a photoelectron spectr spectrum at an energy which probes mostly the P character, we will get all the three different bonding orbitals and non-bonding orbitals represented in the spectroscopy. But in the X-ray emission, we have much less structure in the spectrum. And that we can assign to changes due to this core hole dynamics. So this case is now for an ice. It's not an isolated molecule. And in ice, then we need to do some more approximate treatment, like a classical dynamics. And we perform this classical dynamic simulation. We can see that hydrogen bonding in the ice increases the dynamics even further and makes the dissociation even faster than in gas phase. And the spectral shape as a function of time will change fast. And then we can see that that is causing the differences between the foot emission and the X-ray emission. And we can also look at the smaller details of how does the X-ray emission spectrum depend on the, the duration of the sample. This has been done also in water. And I, I won't go into detail here. But looking at the same type of effects, you can establish two different interpretations, which is now being discussed in the literature. So one is that these details in the spectrum seen in, at high resolution X-ray emission spectroscopy could be assigned to different configurations of the water molecules. Because you have a liquid, you have a lot of different environments of, of water molecules. The other interpretation is along the line that I've discussed so far, is that the, these dynamical effects can create new features in the, in the spectrum, which is not simply due to the electronic states, but also due to nuclear dynamics. And of course, in order to resolve the question of this type, we really have to push the theory. So we have to push it in the direction of more accurate simulations of the dynamics and more accurate simulations of the spectra, of the energy levels and the transitions. So this is a nice example of where, where theory can be used meaningfully on a low level, but can also create a discussion because of different approximations on a higher level of accuracy. OK. Um, I'll briefly mention that, as Alexander showed, this can also be seen in other cases, in gas phase molecules. And in particular, it can be seen in the high resolution spectrum of the elastic peak, meaning that we go from the ground state to core excited state and back to the ground state. This would be a single line if we didn't have any nuclear dynamics, but we see a large progression, a broad pro progression of states. And at high resolution, we can then study this in detail. And the surprising thing that even as in a complex liquid like acetone, we can resolve these quantum effects. So that's really pushing the limit of the spectroscopy to where you can study detailed molecular environments in a liquid also. So I'll skip it. Um, 15 minutes? OK. Uh, continuing on the line of how we interpret this X-ray emission spectrum and, and the photo emission spectrum, I'll point to this nice data produced in, in Anders Nilsson's lab, where they made a comparison of gas, liquid water, and ice, and looked at the difference in spectroscopy and in spectroscopic signal in the photo emission spectrum. And the first thing is, you see is that if you do this at different ionization energies, you see clear differences in the spectra. I don't know if anybody is working with photo emission spectroscopy. What but do you have any idea what this could be due to? Yeah. 
So what happens if you have a system of different kind of molecular orbitals like this, which have different character. You can see that these are of P character around the oxygen and S character around the hydrogens. This has a mixture of S character because it's in plane and allows for a mixing between the S and P. And this is then purely P character around the oxygen because of the symmetry of the orbitals. So what we can use here and what has been used is the fact that if you look at the cross sections for different types of molecular states or orb atomic states, we can use the foot emission energy to probe different and enhance different types of character. So at low energies, the P character will dominate or at least be higher. And at higher energies, the S character will dominate. And that means that in this way, we can sim simply experimentally decompose the electronic structure into the components of S and P character, which is the basis we are using in the quantum chemical calculations. And we can simulate that by going into the quantum chemical calculation and looking at the S and the P character in, of the water molecules, locally, of course, in a more complex system. And what we can see is that the ice and the liquid water is strikingly different, even though the bonding is of similar character. So in ice, you have a strict tetrahedral environment, whereas in water, of course, you have a more fluid system, which is changing all the time. And I'll skip this quiz due to time. But these effects, then, we can relate very easily to ground state dynamics. And what is happening with the electronic structure as a function of the changes in hydrogen bonding of the water molecules. So if you have a case where we follow a water molecule on a short time scale, this is of course just done in the simulations, we can see that we have this splitting if the environment stays intact all the time. But if you have changes in bonding around the water, mole uh, water molecule, the difference is in hydrogen bonding, the hydrogen bond being broken, then we see that this splitting changes. And that, of course, means that if you think about averaging over different configurations, as we have done here in the simulations, we get a smearing of this effect. But in ice, we have this very strict four-state picture, so that going from the water molecule to the ice, we get the splitting of states and we create new electronic states. And this we can then, going from the spectroscopy into the details of the simulations, we get a recent analysis in this way, and we can f look at how it looks like. So this is how the water molecules interact. And we can see that if for a bonding and anti-bonding combination of the three one orbitals between different water molecules, and that creates this electronic splitting in the, in the the spectra. And we can also see that for the lowest state, it's changing in energy, but it's always localized. So these states are sensitive to changes in, in dynamics, like the vibration of the water molecule, but it's not really molecular interactions. In this case, we have a very sharp line, and that is because this is not sensitive to the geometry of the water molecule and not sensitive to environment that we get a very sharp peak. OK, uh, the, the point I want to make now in the last minutes is that when you go to L-edge spectroscopy, you have relativistic effects which makes it essential to do high level calculations. The orbital representation is totally useless for a, a reasonable reproduction of the experimental spectrum. And the reason for this is, of course, that if you look at L-edge spectroscopy, you have 2p holes being created. And the 2p hole have an angular momentum and a spin momentum. And you have a strong spin-orbit coupling between these. And the whole work, we are going through a series of different compounds now in comparison between theory and experiment, but it's all induced by this experiment presented by Philippe. So trying to figure out a good method which could be used in time-resolved experiments.
we can look at, look at how we calculate these <coughs> and what kind of accuracy we need by thinking about the complexity. Of course, a simulation of a transition metal in solution is never fully symmetric. It's always distorted. But for the electronic structure, these distortions are not really essential. So you get more or less the same electronic structure if you consider an isolated, fully symmetric complex. And if you look at the core levels, you can even use this kind of spherical symmetric for, uh, terminology because the splitting is mostly due to, to the spin orbit effects of the isolated atom. So that's a huge effect, 10 EV effect in the spectrum. <clears throat> On top of that, we have to consider interactions between the valence orbitals and the core levels. And then we make this kind of high-level post hart fock calculations, the COS-SF or RAS-SF calculations, <clears throat> where we both include core excitations, and we have this spin-orbit coupling, and different kind of valence excitations in the problem. So if we do this, uh, just as we did before for the for a simpler case, we have to consider the amount of, of determinants needed to represent the valence excited states. And this then corresponds to having a D8 configuration, two holes, and that generates 45 states. These are distributed over triplet states and singlet states. We have the core excited states, which no, now have a D9 configuration instead and we generate 60 microstates. So that's all the electronic states and all the determinants included in the calculations. And using transitions from the ground state to the core excited states, we get a very good agreement with the experiment. And in particular, what we see is that looking at the different core edges, so edges where the core levels are, are um, coupled differently, we can reproduce the different intensities between these core levels. And that's really showing us that we have a very good representation, both of the core levels and the coupling between the core levels and the excited states. And this is sort of the framework of the calculations. Using this, we can do the Rick spectrum, as we did before for the water molecule. Now it has the complication that we have two edges, of course. But it's, again, for each core excitation, we can look at the decay pathways. And we can even calculate the fluorescence yield spectrum by summing up of these spectra, if you like. One of the most interesting parts of these transition methods is that we want to study transitions of, of different kinds, electronic transitions, metal to ligand, ligand to metal transitions. And this is just showing that by expanding the active space, including other orbitals than the d orbitals, we can look at ligand to metal and metal to ligand charge transfer. We can sort of talk about where they would contribute in the spectrum, which of course uh, enables us to interpret the experimental spectrum. So that is forming the framework we want to use for the time resolved x ray spectroscopies of, of transition metals in solutions. But still, this is a very limited system. It's highly symmetric. It's a small system. And we have made a, a few tests going to larger systems. And that is perhaps the most important development and trying to make the calculations on the same accuracy, but much more efficient, so that we can treat systems of, of, of relevance, perhaps for photochemistry or other types of applications. And we can see that. Having this framework, we have the advantage of being able to simulate the spectra. We have the access to the excited states, and that means that we can always calculate excited state spectra. So here is a comparison of the spectra for different electronic configurations. And we can look at the nuclear effect. So looking at changing the geometry for a given excited state, we can look at the spectral response for that. OK. I'll summarize on the slide towards the end here. And I want to acknowledge, of course, the students in the group working on different projects in connection to X-ray spectroscopy, and importantly, all the experimental collaborators. And this is not the complete list, but this is the most important collaborators at present. So thank you very much. <laughs>
For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.